Well, all righty. We did the Twitter questions for this week's Q&A. Now it's time for part two of the weekly Q&A. Let me fix the collar here. Oh, Jesus, looks horrible. Probably should have done that before I came on camera. But anyways, all right, it's time for the Facebook questions. Thanks to you that took to the Otero Central Facebook page. Most of your questions there. Keep in mind, again, not all of them have been answered. I tried to pick through some of the best and some of the brightest from this particular version. You know, keep submitting your questions in the future. If you didn't get them answered this time, they may very well in the future. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. Rodney Cotton. Do you feel like wrestling today sucks only because the 90s wrestling set the bar too high? Uh, no, because I could sit there and say that you know, 80s wrestling could have set the bar too high for the 90s, but the 90s were able to figure out their own way and become their own huge deal. Well, wrestling sucks today because of a multitude of factors, a lack of competition, a lack of originality and creativity, a lack of talent in the business, a lack of storytelling. I mean, there are so many different things. You know, while you can sit there and say that wrestling popped in the late 90s and it takes a long time to build that back, I mean, we're talking about 15 plus years now, that excuse goes out the door. The biggest reason wrestling today sucks is because the people today running wrestling companies fucking suck. Plain and simple. That's why it sucks. Uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Davidson. I heard a Bret Hart mark say that the only reason Bret never reached Hogan's level is because Bret was never given his fair shot. Because at the time, Bret was at the top during was during the height of the steroid and sex scandal. Your thoughts on that statement? Sounds like some more nonsensical... Bret Hart and Mark bullshit dribble that even tasteless Tony T wouldn't have said to me back in the day. This is that delusional fantasy island bullshit where the only people that believe more in the bullshit of Bret Hart than Bret Hart are the Bret Hart fans. I mean, that's ridiculous. There is no way, shape, or form that Bret Hart was ever going to be bigger than Hulk Hogan, even if Hulk Hogan would have put him over six months straight on like three or four different WWF pay-per-views back in the early 90s. It just wasn't going to happen. Bret Hart was a top guy in that company for several years. And there were a lot of problems, you know, Bret Hart you know, was a top guy at a bad time in the company, but he got his shot. He got a fair shot. He most certainly did. He most certainly did. So I dispute strongly when somebody says he didn't get a fair shot, because to me, he most certainly did. You know, he was a star. You know, he was a good star to have on the international level as well. But to sit there and make that type of excuse, no. He just wasn't as big of a star as Hogan. He didn't have that same type of appeal. The machine behind Bret Hart didn't work the same as it did for Hogan. The era was different. It was a, Yes, it was a time in general wrestling struggle, but to sit there and make that type of excuse to even imply that Brett would have ever been as big of Hogan if all things were equal is fucking ridiculous, in my opinion. Juan Bismorales, and you can tell him I said that. Juan Bismorales, who would you rather spend a whole day with, Kane or Big Show, and death is not an option. No, if I had to spend a day with somebody, it'd be Glenn Jacobs, it'd be Kane. We talk about all types of libertarian shit, and I think we'd have a good time. I'd, I'd go with Kane. I could spend a day with Kane. I'd probably spend a day with Big Show, too, I'm sure, but I could see more um, commonalities between myself and Kane. Uh, Derek Archer, do you think the Houston Rockets would have given the Bulls a run for their money in the 90s? Um, yeah, specifically, if you're talking about those 94 and 95 Rockets teams that won the back-to-back -back titles when Michael Jordan was saving the universe from basketball playing aliens called Monstars, uh, if there was ever a team that was going to, that Hakeem-led team had a chance. I mean, you had, you know, one of the best centers in the history of the NBA, Hakeem. He had a good crew of role players around him that spaced the floor well. They defended. They could hit the open shot. I mean, they still would have had to found a way to beat Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. I don't think personally they would have. But it wouldn't have surprised me if one of those two Rockets teams would have taken the Bulls to seven games. Maybe both the 94 and 95 teams, even especially that 95 team that had Drexler on it. Uh, there's a very good chance that they would have taken the Bulls seven games. And part of it's of being the Jordan fan that I am and the Bulls fan that I am, I would refuse to admit that the Rockets could have beat them. But well, there's certainly a chance, especially with Hakeem. I mean, you know, 
when you talk about greatness of greatness to me of players in my lifetime, one of those players that is criminally forgotten about is Hakeem. I mean, especially in that 95 stretch when David Robinson, I think, was it David Robinson won the MVP award? And Hakeem is like, he's got my award. And he fucking dream fake the shit out of him. And he fucking owned Shaq in the finals when the Rockets swept the Magic. <laughs> Dude is a beast. Uh, Jeremy Adams. Let's see here. Is Kendrick Lamar the closest to Tupac in hip hop today? If he is, then what the fuck does that say about hip-hop? What a great art form filled with knuckleheads and non-original, non-creative turds. Like, I sit there and I legitimately look, and maybe it comes across as the jaded old white guy now, with me being all in my mid-30s. I don't fucking know. But I sit there and look at somebody like a Nicki Minaj, and then I listen to the lyrics she'll have in a freaking track. And I'll say, why the fuck does anybody listen to this bitch? How the hell does this classify as talent or rap or hip-hop in any way, shape, or form? This passes off as talent! It's because you think she's got a donk of a dingleberry patch back there with her ass. Doesn't mean she has fucking talent. I mean, it's pathetic when I hear these different artists. I sit there and say, holy shit. This is talent. This is supposed to be good. Kendrick Lamar, get the fuck out of here with that shit. <laughs> I mean, so I'm sorry. I'm just telling it how it is. Rap game's been bad for years. Oh, look at me. I got 14 songs on the album. Let's have 13 of them where I collaborate with at least three different fucking people on each one. Bums. Connor Boyd, how did you meet Triple T, and is there an update on how his daughter is doing? Uh, first time I met Triple T was back when both of us were assistant managers for Foot Locker. He was an assistant manager at the Cedar Falls store. I was assistant manager at the Cherryville Mall store in Rockford. Um, it was back in, was that? that was 2006, because shortly after that, he ended up getting his own store in Cedar Falls. And then I got a store in Waterloo. Um, so that's the first time we met him. He didn't like me very much because he thought I didn't shut up during the meeting. I don't quite remember it that way, but that's what it is. So they could very well be right. Who the fuck knows? It is whatever. Um, and then in terms of uh, how his daughter is doing, his daughter is doing pretty well. For those of you that don't know, she uh, was diagnosed at, oh, God, Christ. It was... Uh, Back in, I think, late portion 2013, it was it was a little bit after I moved out to Virginia, she got diagnosed with leukemia. So, you know, obviously that's been a, a big whole process trying to uh, fight that bot battle. But good thing is that battle has been fought successfully. She's on the, uh, you know, the long path of remission, you know, recovery. She's, she's doing quite well, you know, and assuming as well as any kid that has been through that type of situation could possibly be doing. So, you know, their family's doing well. She, Aubrey's doing well. You know, so hopefully it stays that way. Probably a lot of you didn't even know about that, but yeah. So, you know, that's a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a motherfucker of a thing too. sit there and find out that, you know, your kid has a type of illness like that. You know, that's, that's a scary thought, you know. But um, doing well, though. Last time I talked to him, which has been a little bit, I think it was actually around draft time. So I probably need to call him and Mr. Out and all those guys and see how the hell they're doing. They may or may not even want to hear from me. Who knows? Uh, Josh Giles, what are your favorite non-sports-related interests and hobbies? Um, politics, history, uh, Serena Williams' vagine. Um, <laughs> some will say black lesbian porn, which is always going to be a big hit with me. Um, but to, to be fair, I don't mind interracial lesbian porn either. I want to make you feel like I'm discriminating against the white ladies or etc. I mean, because at the end of the day, they're still scissoring and rubbing muffs and fucking doing lesbian things. So I can get down with that most certainly. Mm -hmm. So those would be some of my interests. It would obviously be in any particular order. 
History, politics, black lesbian porn, those will be just a few of them. And I have others too, but those are the ones that stand out to me the most. Uh, Kurt Seifert. What could the WWE as a company do to immediately spark interest in their currently stale product? Uh, there are a lot of things they could do, but in terms of immediately spark interest in their product, like immediately spark interest in their product, there would only be one thing. Like the quickest knee jerk, most likely to get a huge response, overwhelming interest would be a John Cena heel turn. That's it. That would be the thing above things. Because even the people that say this is the same old shit or this is boring, dull, repetitive, and all the things that so are true, what could you say if they turn John Cena heel? That instantly makes it at least somewhat must-see television for the time being because you want to see what the fuck they're going to do with John Cena as a bad guy. Going against everything that he's ever stood for for a freaking decade. Uh, Dylan Stevenson, do you feel it would be a good idea to have NXT guys compete in pre-shows at pay-per-views? Yes. And sometimes even as opening matches on the main card itself. You know, part of the purpose of NXT is to get them ready for the main roster. What better way to find out if they're ready for the, ready for the main roster besides sending them on the road on house shows and on dark matches than to get them in front of the cameras, get them in front of the bigger crowds, and see how they respond? Michael Cohen, where would you put Bo Jackson in history? Uh, best athlete I've ever seen. Also, tragically, kind of fits into the what could have been category. You know, what if he would have just focused on baseball and never played football? Maybe he never gets that hip injury, and maybe he's end up ends up in Canton someday, or not Canton, excuse me, he ends up at Cooperstown in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Or what happens if he never injures his hip, and he goes on to play several more years of both baseball and football? Are we looking at a guy that's a two-sport Hall of Famer? Just a phenomenal force of nature. Bo oh, Jackson was something else. And what a media machine he had behind him with Nike, you know, Bo knows. I mean, it was just incredible. Just incredible. I can remember being a little kid collecting cards. One of the big deals, things to have, was a 1988 Topps Bo Jackson rookie card. So, you know, Bo was a beast. A beast. Uh, Davy Jefferson, what do you think about the stuff Donald Trump has been saying recently, and how stupid do you think that it is that he's in the WWE Hall of Fame? Uh, you know, I don't know if it's stupid that he's in the WWE Hall of Fame. There are plenty of other people in there that have said racist and done racist things and other stupid shit. So where's Donald Trump any different? You, know, you can look at a lot of ways. He probably is very similar to Vince McMahon in a lot of their views, honestly. So in some ways, it's almost like having Vince in the Hall of Fame. Uh, in terms of uh, stuff he's been saying recently, I almost want him to continue to say it. I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Donald Trump is a more legitimate presidential candidate on the GOP side than people want to give him credit for or people want to believe. Because in so many ways, he is the perfect, and I emphasize again, the perfect modern GOP candidate. Over the age of 60, Caucasian, bad hair, says incredibly stupid things, and his views are incredibly out of touch and borderline racist. That you know, A man that comes from a lot of money, you know, just like Mitt Romney did, you know, representing the interest of the rich. Donald Trump is the GOP. He's a legit candidate in that party. He really is. Especially in the primary side. You get to general election side, he gets creamed. But on the, on the primary side, he's a formidable force. He's something to be reckoned with, I assure you. I assure you. And especially if he starts coming out against the Confederate flag being banned. Oh, Christ, it takes him to a whole different level. He is the presumptive candidate on the GOP side. He'll be in the debates, and he's a guy that's not going to be afraid, and he's a guy that can debate well. You know, like I said, to me, he is the perfect GOP candidate, and I hope he stays in the race as long as possible because he exposes the GOP for what it has become and what it represents. Look, I'm not sitting there telling anybody to vote for the Democratic Party by, or Democratic candidates by any stretch of the imagination because I think Hillary Clinton in a lot of ways is just as bad as most of the people on the GOP side. Bernie Sanders has quite a bit of appeal to me, you know, just in some ways like an Elizabeth Warren would, but Bernie Sanders may be more so, but that doesn't necessarily mean I would support that. I'm not going to sit there and tell somebody to vote for the Democratic candidate because, again, I don't like a lot of what that party does, um, but I don't understand how anybody in good conscience could be a Republican and feel proud about that. And I most certainly wouldn't tell anybody to ever vote for a fucking Republican in today's political climate, especially on a national level. I'm telling you you have to vote for a Democrat, because in a lot of cases, I wouldn't advocate for it either. Jake Rossett, 
Why do so many people overrate the invasion angle? I've talked about this before. Is it Jack or Jake Rawson? I'm not sure. I'll, I'll go with Jack Rawson. Um, the reason they overrate the invasion angle is it's a generational thing. And I've, I've, I've talked about this before, and I'll explain it again for those that have never heard me talk about this. If you're in my age bracket, let's say 30 to 40, you know, I'm 34, in a lot of ways you hated the invasion angle because you grew up for years with WCW and WWF. Um, then you were also there as an adult or as a, a teenager, a, you know, older teenager, when ECW started to come into their own. And you remember those things. And you remember the battles. You remember the wars on an adult level. And you remember how much those companies used to mean to you. And then you saw what happened. And all the shit you talked about on the old... Uh, forum sites and everything else and in the chat rooms and you saw what actually ended up happening it pissed you off this is the shit you had been thinking about for a fucking decade you've been thinking about it for years and that's the bullshit they gave you whereas if you're younger let's say in the 22 to 28 crowd that was really your first introduction to wrestling you didn't have the same emotional connection or investment to a wcw or an ecw uh, you pretty much only knew WWF, and you thought with all these people coming in and doing all this crap that that was good and this was cool. It's a, it's a generational thing. It's a generational thing in terms of fans. I think most fans under the age of 18, and now when they go back and look at what happened in the Invasion Angle, they're like, there were some good TV moments, but the shit was stupid. Those fans in that 22 to 28 age range, uh, they usually like the Invasion Angle. I think they're ridiculous for liking the Invasion Angle. I know... I you know Ashley likes the invasion angle. I tell her all the time what a piece of shit that was. But she didn't have the same emotional connection to it that I did. She didn't feel the same way about it as I did. My perspective on it was much different than hers. It was. So that's why I think older people hated the invasion angle. And it drove those type of fans off in great droves. Um, but the younger fans that grew up on it, you know, it was, it was their version of the Hogan times like it was for me. So there you go. Uh, Alberto Torres. Who is the tougher opponent for the Chicago Bulls title runs? The New York Knicks or the Detroit Pistons? Well, it's the Pistons. <laughs> the only time the Knicks bounced the Bulls from the playoffs that I can recall was in 94, and that still took them seven games, and that was without Michael Jeffrey Jordan when he was out there saving the world from the basketball playing aliens called Monstars. He was the saving the world. He was saving the universe. He was saving the solar system. He was saving everything. The Pistons beat him three straight years in the playoffs. Uh, the Pistons were tougher because the Pistons were the obstacle to where the Bulls ultimately wanted to get to. The Knicks more so were the bullies that the champs had to deal with, and they were the ones trying to take what the Bulls had. The Knicks were tough. I, hate the, I hated those teams. I hate those teams now, but I respect the shit out of them. I miss the days when you had those type of rivalries, but I feared the Pistons. I never feared the Knicks. Big difference. Martin James. Why do you hate Dino Bravo and Jeff Jarrett so much? I shouldn't really have to explain why the fuck I don't like Jeff Jarrett. As far as Dino Bravo, frankly, again, I don't really think I should have to explain much why I don't like Dino Bravo. Dino Bravo fucking sucked. And he's dead. But mostly he sucked. And Jeff Jarrett sucks. And still sucks. He's a fucking egomaniac. A fucking self-centered prick and fucking terrible for the business. I've given plenty of thoughts on the way I feel about Dino Bravo and Jeff Jarrett. No other reason is needed other than the fact that they're Dino Bravo and Jeff Jarrett. People watching this, I want to explain to you other reasons why I don't like those two SOBs are free to do so in the comments. And the Rusty Gillespie closes this out by asking, Will Kevin Owens be a WWE World Heavyweight Champion by 2017? I will certainly hope it would come sooner because by that point in time, if it didn't already happen, that means Vince has probably lost interest and in who the hell knows what's going to happen with him. You know, the way things are trending at this point, Owens might end up being the champ before 2015 is over. But I'd have to envision, worst case scenario, he gets it at some point in time in 2016. You know, as much as they brought him in on that level, and as much as they've done with him already, uh, this one needs to happen. So anyways, thanks to you guys that 
earlier, took to Twitter and submitted your questions. Those that posted your questions on Facebook. I enjoy doing these Q&As. I'll be back again next week with another one, probably done in a similar manner. Twitter questions on one video, Facebook questions on the other video. And make sure you check out all the other content that's recently been uploaded here on OTR Essential. And stay tuned for other great videos soon to come.